question. My name is Andrea Sway. I'm an associate professor at San Francisco State University. Um, and I apologize for being late today. We are hearing from uh, two uh, PACVEC trainees um, to talk about their research. Um, first, we're going to hear from Adam. Am I, do I have the right one? From Adam Borsino from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and then we'll hear from Kyle Yamagita from the University of California Davis. Um, Adam is going to speak today about comparative genomics of Aedes albopictus in the uh, Kwajalein atoll for developing arbovirus vector dispersal model. So. Um, Adam, do you want to go ahead and take it from here? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, can everybody see my screen or my presentation? Looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, so before I move on, I just want to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Seng Yu Siuk, uh, a new graduate student under Dr. Lee, uh, Joanna Chu, and Yu Siuk Lee, without whom I, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this. I mean, uh, my my background in the service is actually college lead ecology and modeling, and though I have, did, did, used to do some genetics in graduate school, that was still 11 years ago, and right now I'm mainly a modeler for the service. So so I needed to expand my repertoire, and by um, this PACVEC training has, has definitely done that. Um, before I move on, I just I, the service requires me to to put this potential caveat within my presentations, and the findings and conclusions of this presentation are of me, the authors, and do not necessarily represent the views of the service. So mainly, this is so that we can actually give presentations rather than having to review it through upper management all the time. So it actually is helpful, though the caveat can be misleading at times. Um, you may wonder why uh, service personnel is actually in, interested in arboviral diseases or zoonotic diseases. Well, I mean, other than, you know, the current pandemic is caused by a zoonotic disease and maybe you're thinking, well, it's about time the service got interested. The other things that we're interested in, obviously, in, uh, in endangered species. Um, in about 2013, 2014, I started conducting some research and, and uh, essentially informing the service using, using models on the potential or the future of forest birds or native Hawaiian forest birds in Hawaii, we eventually published a paper showing that, you know, in the very near future, within the next century, we're going to see essentially an ecological disaster, a, a, a severe mass extinction event related to these um, native Hawaiian forest birds. And this is mainly due to their, how they're relegated to upper elevation refu refugia due to um, avian malaria that is vectored by Culex fasciatus. And in those upper elevation refugia, uh, Culex cannot necessarily breed and so they're they're lacking in those areas but obviously with climate change that will not be the case that is not the case and though we thought at the time that we would have at least some time to work on this we are seeing helix incursions and avian malaria expansions into these refugia as we speak um so at the time we decided to kind of move forth we wanted to study well what are these tools what can we adapt and what in the field can we adapt to these uh kind of controlling helix in the field um and so obviously we moved into the health sphere Following that, then a large outbreak of dengue occurred on the islands. Um, I should point out that the prior administration in Hawaii, and this was quite some time ago, depleted the entomologist and studying uh, arboviral, vector, arboviral vectors in Hawaii to two. Um, this was a massive reduction in workforce regarding these you know, massively important agents. So they, they did not have the, the bandwidth actually to help us and they searched for new tools. But following this outbreak, funding increase and then they kind of went, then we kind of worked block and uh, lockstep. But during this time between now and the, then and the arboviral outbreak, we actually expanded our viewpoint and contacted many um, within the field regarding these new tools that are being developed for uh, for use in, in controlling these vectors, disease vectors. Um, at the same time, what we also did, and this is a graphic uh, developed by a single sook, um, showing the, the arboviral disease outbreaks in the Pacific Islands from Hawaii, Guam, Marshall Islands, Islands, Federal State of Micronesia over time, number of locations and over time. Um, and what we're seeing is actually an expansion of dengue, which, which you know, given globalization, everything else that's going on makes sense. Incursion of the waterline, it's, it's quite, quite the epidemic, to say the least, even though we have a, a more prominent one going on right now. Um, 
So what we'd done in the meantime was actually contact DARPA, and DARPA was very interested in our work, mainly due to their dengue outbreaks, due to uh, military personnel primarily, and more as military personnel are, I mean, you get more casualties and more reduction in, in workforce or force uh, due to these vectors and then the diseases caused by these vectors than you actually get in the war setting. So they were very interested in these new tools. And we were very interested in the development of these tools, new tools for application and, and conservation. Um, they understood that we kind of were, we had kind of this, this overview of islands and that we kind of protected and, and, and understood. And, and they wanted to understand like, well, if we were to conduct field site releases and some, what, where would that be and what would it look like? And so we derived an assessment of field site criteria, um, mainly informed by National Academy, Academies of Sciences and WHO, real world natural setting, isolated and safe, controlled areas, small, no personnel and no endangered protected species. And given that the tools at the time were mostly developed for AZ Gypti, hopefully, it, ideally, it would have, have AZ Gypti. I want to preface this by saying that though they were interested in this field, in conducting this field um, work in the time, DARPA, which some of you may know is, you know, the, the, the entity that funded the, the integration of the internet, or maybe less of you know that it was the in, initial prior to NIH, the, the, the uh, funding mechanism that, that funded the development of NRA, mRNA vaccines. So, you know, those, those, are, those are broadly applicable, I would think, uh, at least right now. And they were at the time researching uh, these, new, these new or next generation of, of vector control tools. But I want to preface it by saying that at no time has DARPA released or and DARPA does not have any plans to release at this time um, anything in any site. Uh, I think that's, that's an important preface, just in case anybody is thinking that they are going to. But nonetheless, they were interested in what a field site would look like and potentially what, what we would come up with with regards to a field site. And what we came up with was, well, we think as the service, the, the most isolated and probably the, the, the one with at least some moderate level of infrastructure is that associated with Kwajalein Atoll. Kwajalein Atoll is, a, is an atoll within the Republic of Marshall Islands. A subset of islands, islets within that atoll are leased by the U.S. government. Um, uh, some of you may know this as, as based on its military base, but it's also uh, a site where some of the initial SpaceX launches for their reusable rockets were uh, developed and, and implemented. Uh, there, there's a whole book about that, which I thought was interesting. But nonetheless, this this was a subset of those leased islets are are of those islets are leased by the U.S. government, and these are that subset. And these islets are accessible, though some maybe by helicopter, primarily by boat. So to get to them you actually have to charter for 200 over well a great deal of money a boat and some of these islands you actually have to swim in um swim to from the reef so we actually have expertise in in that we've we've developed we've kind of been to those islands in the past and we've um, conducted some species assessments in there and so darpa asked us well okay that that's great you know um could you guys do some some assessments of those islands essentially identify the the, the vectors in the islands and the blood so blood sources of uh, blood hosts within those islands as well. Um, and I should also emphasize that one of the other factors that made Kwajalein kind of important to us wasn't just its, its, its isolation, but also prior to this, there had been a large and major outbreak of dengue and Zika within the island, within the islets. Um, prior to our arrival, there were about 800 cases. And talking to some of the vector control pra practitioners at the site and around the area, um, and, and most of these were just, just medical doctors who, who you know, they, they treat the symptoms, not the source or not the cause, which is kind of common in, in departments of health in, in some areas. You know, they, they needed the expertise in order to control the vector of, of these diseases. And, and so we thought that, okay, not only is it isolated, not known, only would it, would it uh, you know, expand our work, but it also bring in a level of expertise and control to these islets and to this area that would, um, you know, be at least somewhat helpful. I mean, I think uh, Lim can speak, Lim Paparai can probably speak to um, more of the health of the area and what they're doing currently, but at the time that was our thought process. And so prior to that field, uh, during that field site assessment, and, and I should say that, you know, this was swimming into some highlands, boating into some islands, and though you see a helicopter pad on some of those islands, that helicopter pad is inactive and in inactivated, and we were on, not allowed to actually take a, hel a helicopter to some of these areas. Um, but going to these islands will, will just a basic subset of those islands this is what we found. Um, and I should say also that prior to this, it was thought that only 80 Egypti was uh, within, um, within the Kwajalein Atoll islets, or at least the least islets, and we did not find any Egypti. We only found Alpictus. 
potentially a sign of satirization. That might be important, important later, but from an ecologist's perspective, like I'm wondering why, what happened? Um, what is this, this uh, changeover of species? And I know in the mainland you have that satirization, you have other things you know, uh, um, that may be occurring as well, but I, I find this somewhat interesting. Um, but I also was thinking, you know, if we were to do field site releases on these islands, we need to understand more than just the species on the islands. We need to understand the connectivity. Um, and knowing that the population genetics approach was likely the best way to understand connectivity, uh, we used or we started to to investigate more about you know how we can pursue that and how we can pursue that specifically within the Apopictus to to infer and define connectivity between islands such that it would inform not only the ecology of the system but the efficiency and efficacy and safety of any release conducted. So it was not only for this site as as a proof of concept but a proof of concept in general. Like how do we define the population connectivity to expand efficacy within an island system for field site releases, not just caution and toll. Um, and I'm going to go kind of on the sidetrack here. And this, this is actually one of the islets that's partially released. Uh, this was in the non leased area. This area, this cistern, which was a, a former Japanese bunker that had been bombed out during World War II, was filled with wrigglers. It was, uh, it was quite apparent there was a large 80s Alpapictus population on that island. You could just scoop them up. It was quite easy. Um, and we talked to some of the population there, and they said, you know, my, my, my grandmother just had chikungunya. My, my, I'm worried about my daughter. All these other things, and it's it was quite apparent that something needed to be applied, at least at a landscape scale, at the very least at a landscape scale. Um, and these new tools are more than necessary, at least for the area and the, the region, and definitely for Hawaii as well. Um, but we also came to the conclusion that it's not just causally the toll that needs these tools, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, we need to understand in a broad context, if these tools were applied, you know, how, what is the differentiation between the populations, with, at least within the, um, the territories, the U.S. Uh, specific care territories, um, and how, do they, how are they related to one another? Um, and by doing so, I think we can then kind of define differentiation, immigration, etc. Uh, on a broader scale. So we can do it at a very focused, localized scale as well as a broader scale to define kind of levels of association. And so that was kind of phase two of the expansion beyond, or the expansion beyond Kwashiorkor um, Atoll. And another side note, uh, the, the development of this project actually led to the development of another project I'm working on with Omar Yusuf and, and Johnny Marshall. Um, and that is kind of a, a modeling approach for risk assessments and benefits of the PG, of PGSIT or, or precision guided sterile insect technique recently developed in Omar's lab um, for Aedes aegypti eradication in Hawaii. And yes, we still have Aedes aegypti in Hawaii, though, though many of the islands don't seem to have large populations. Um, there's still some small detections here and there, especially on the big island. And so we're looking for eradication of that. And it's the primary vector, at least identified by the Hawaii Department of Health, of um, dengue in the islands. So anyway, but that's that's kind of on a tangent. Getting back to the work that we're the work at hand, um, we decided to go kind of a, a next generation sequencing approach. We'd I'd actually done some very low level, kind of unrefined analyses of the sequences prior to this, but I really wanted to get into kind of a whole genome sequencing analysis, which I had no expertise in, and which, which and that's came where PACVEC kind of came came to my rescue. I wanted to expand my knowledge base uh, to conduct the next generation sequencing and whole genome analyses. And one way to do that was through, um, through use of PACVEC. And initially we actually developed a new sequencing method for low volume next gen sequencing um, and it has been published in, in Job. And it essentially provides a budget friendly magnetic bead based DNA extraction protocol. Um, and it's for smaller labs, but it expands the use of NGFs uh, or next generation sequencing to those smaller labs. So you don't need some automated technique. And by doing so, you're actually increasing accuracy of analyses versus regular Sanger sequencing. You're kind of increasing co coverage, increasing percent amount, and you know, and by doing so, you're actually increasing the specificity of the analysis at hand. And of course, the, the ease of we developed this tool to be a kind of a easy application. So it can be kind of implemented within any existing DNA extraction pipeline. And so following that, you know, essentially the DNA extraction, which obviously is the first step, we then went for, well, what sequencing approach are we going to use? Um, previously, you know, the, the state of the art was the HiSeq 4000, but um, in about 2018, NovaSeq came online, which 
was order of magnitudes better. Even though the initial costs were higher, the cost per base pair was far lower. And the, the, um, the coverage, percent coverage for the specific species, et cetera, was far greater. So we decided to go with the Nova sequencer. And it's a good thing we did because during that time, the cost of the NovaSeq actually reduced significantly. So we were actually able to increase the number of samples um, that we were able to use. Um, I mean, just, just to give you some idea of what, what, what the end result from sequencing looked like, yeah, the percent coverage was great. We had a great percent coverage. Mapping percent was lower for some of the specimens um, versus others. And we also incorporated kind of LA samples just to kind of add that increase in resolution. Some of them failed. I mean, and that was not necessarily due to the sequencing approach. That was mainly due to uh, possibly a problem when pooling. But because we had that um, increased, uh, because of the lower cost, we were actually re able to rerun them. And as such, we were able to redo them and get a, a relatively good sequence from the Guam samples, for instance, and more recent Guam samples. Um, but at the same time, we kind of came on, came to another problem. So the current, uh, the current kind of reference genome for Aedes albopictus, which is one of the largest genomes um, defined to date for Achillosidae, it was just 2 million base pairs or approximately 2 million base pairs, did not seem to map well with, with our correct genome, with our, with our, um, with our results using the, the kind of tried and true methods. And what happened was the mitre reads were generally pulled away when mapping to the newest reference, most supposedly accurate reference tree, uh, reference sequence. So we actually kind of had to go with this more sequential sequencing approach, uh, making de novo sequences per or per individual, et cetera. And though, and you can see that on in this graphic on the top is kind of the competitive map, mapping with mitogenome, and essentially that uh, that problem where you get uh, pulling away from of the of the organism's mitogenome when it's mapped, and you're trying to define the mitogenome of the of the sequence individual with the reference sequence versus on the bottom the de novo sequence, um, and it seemed to do that'd be much better. But it, there were still some gaps. Uh, and talking with you, so we. It seems that there are similar issues with the Aedes aegypti reference to the genome, um, and it's primarily due to presences of pseudogenes within the reference that may impact variant calling, which we thought was interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a result in itself, and we we kind of have our still developing means to get around this. Um, but the first step in that was actually to develop the de novo sequences for the mito genome using um, something called novoplasty, which was it's a relatively straightforward approach, but it actually takes quite a bit of, of computational power. So, um, you know, we've used some, some supercomputers, for instance, I've been able to use the USGS uh, high performance computer, about 250 cores on that to kind of develop the sequences, align the sequences, and develop the phylogeny for specifically the mitochondrial genome, but we're also working on the nuclear genome as well. Um, and, and I wanna point out that, that the mitogenome is about 16,500 base pairs. So each of these uh, individuals here is 16,000, it's essentially aligning and developing a phylogeny of sick over 16,500 base pairs for each individual. So getting back to the, the Aedes albopictus reference genome that we're having problem or aligning to, that genome that is supposedly the, the newest and best, and, and, but we're having a problem aligning many of our, our things to. But what we did was align its mitochondrial, mitochondrial genome to Aedes albopictus from Fraudulent Atoll as well as Aedes albopictus from everywhere else we could um, define from across you know, Europe and, and uh, Pacific Islands, et cetera. And what we found that the AD albopictus reference genome is most closely related with the Taiwanese or Taiwan genomes or mitochondrial genome, but it's very far removed from everything else, whether it be Pacific-based or, or European-based or, or even in the USA, which we thought was quite interesting, but it, it kind of gives at least it validates why we're having a problem um, aligning many of these, the nuclear genome to, um, to the Kwajalein samples and to many of the other samples that we're, we're looking at. But, you know, this is kind of in a broad, this is more of a broad, uh, broad brush kind of what it looks like over the, the world. When we look at it specifically for kind of Kwajalein Atoll as well as the Pacific region, what we get is something quite interesting and, and something different. And I'll explain. This is this is uh, a strict phylogenetic uh, phylogenetic tree over 15,000 bootstrap replicates. Um, and what it what I mean by strict is essentially though when it only um, defines the nodes that are 
uh, definitive with all, the, all the bootstrap replicates. And this is what we get. We get a partitioning of various individuals across Kwajalein and across the Pacific Islands. And what's interesting is, is that partitioning is very specific. Like it, it, no matter what we do, we get a partition that is associated with the less accessed islands across Kwajalein total, indicating kind of this, this very diverse population, likely indicating that, that there's very few, there's very little migrants between kind of these more impacted or globalized um, Pacific islands like Hawaii or Guam and, and these, Kwaj, these small islands. But at the same time, then we get a kind of a clumping with everything else. Um, Guam and a Garrett, so there's still Kwajalein in there, but it's kind of these, these more accessed islets that are clumping, um, which we thought was extremely interesting because it, it's kind of getting to that idea that, okay, we need to define very specific islands uh, for, and very, very kind of confined, and then there's no immigration within these islands for uh, field site releases. So this kind of gets in a broad brush to that. Like, okay, we wouldn't use an island within the everything else region. We would use something that has quite a lot of genetic diversity, or at least kind of homegrown genetic diversity and, and specific to the site in general. So something along the Allegheny area or more. Um, but I think we can get to, to even more refined from future analysis. And then looking at it in more of a um, majority rule consensus tree, Oh, what we find is that, that there's quite a bit of differentiation between the sequences or differences between the sequences, so much so that even within the everything else or the um, less access islets, there's kind of uh, great support for differences between those islets, so kind of highly diverged differences. Um, I was going to actually go on a tangent about satirization here, given that some of the, 80s, some of the genomes, especially within the um, everything else assessment, or, or actually within the, uh, the, the less access islets seem to fall within the Aedes aegypti kind of realm, which I thought was interesting. These were identified as Aedes apopictus. It's relatively easy to identify. Uh, granted, we were tired. We did have at points heat, heat exhaustion. Uh, one had heat stroke, etc. Swimming in the islands from the boat, all those other things. So I can't rule it out completely, but we did, we did our best, and the biologists involved as well as myself did our best to identify them. Um, to the, the species and relatively easy to do so. So what we might have is mitochondrial inheritance or age regression from the Aedes aegypti due to satirization. This is kind of common, a common one way um, maternal inheritance of the MTD, mtDNA because of that one way uh, cross between uh, Aedes aegypti maternal and Aedes aegypti line versus Aedes apopictus that means with that line. You can get hybrids and those hybrids can kind of keep continue to um, pass on the uh, mtDNA, but I mean that's all. <laughs> I, I, as the ecologist, of course, I'm going to make these inferences, but we really can't make these inferences until we kind of take a closer look at the nuclear genome, and that's what we're in the process of doing right now. I mean, kind of looking at the nuclear genome, seeing how it compares to the mitochondrial genome, and expanding our understanding of the ecology of the system and the and the system in general, and not just Kwajalein system broader system across the Pacific Islands. Um, and I just wanted to relate this to past work that I've done that was not as refined, not as thorough, not as broad. And honestly, it, it's it's lacking to a great degree. Yeah, maybe we, we have some various levels of differentiation between the islands, and maybe I could define, well, you know, there's more relatedness between one versus the other, but there was no kind of classification between the islands. There was no um, there was no way that I could partition islands one or the other versus this large scale whole genome, complete genome sequencing approach kind of increase the resolution of the analysis to such a great degree that it, it just pushes this out of the way. Um, and so some take homes, these are preliminary and I didn't, didn't want to get into too much detail is, as I said before, the partial sequence assessments are not sufficient to understand the ecology or develop an adequate reference to prior work or field trials. Um, and even that, like the references we do have uh, seem to be lacking. So we need to kind of redefine those and, and do some bioinformatics magic to, to, to actually make it more appropriate for the work that we're doing. Um, and this is kind of what I was getting to in the, in the previous slides, variants in mitochondrial DNA versus the nuclear dispersal patterns must be assessed. And, and I, as an ecologist, I, I'm really, I have a bit of a cognitive bias and I really want the satirization kind of model to kind of come through, but I 
I know that it may not. And really what we need is the nuclear dispersal models to assess well, whether that's the case and what, whether these organisms are, are specifically albopictus. And the reasons I want that I think that's interesting is it's showing kind of this this naturally occurring insect compatibility technique um, if you were to use the lingo of Wabaki or at least or SIT. Um, and I think that's relevant in and of itself, not only for you know, basic ecology, but also for any release that may be uh, occurring. You know, there may be some differential interactions with the, with the tool if the mitochondrial DNA is different from, you know, from a completely different species than the, um, than the nuclear DNA. And, you know, some, some of the tools currently being developed, such as gene drives, they are specific to, uh, like, for instance, um, what was it? There was one that was specific for modifications or, or kind of cleavage of mitochondrial DNA, et cetera. So, you know, these, these are things that we need to take into account. Um, I think it's important to note and is that what we found so far and just by that basic clumping is, is dispersal is primarily immune mediated. I mean, in these less accessed islands, it, they are essentially protected by the US military. And though there may be some incursions outside of that, the US military does not go on there uh, very often. And then of course, um, and this is why phase two expanded beyond the islands. There are more islands than just the least ones. If we did not make that conclusion to jump beyond just Kwajalein Atoll, we wouldn't be able to see, well, hey, look, you know, we're actually seeing incursion or Im immigration between, you know, these much larger, more populous islands and specific islands within Kwajalein Atoll, whereas other islands do not have that. And with that, hopefully I didn't take too long. Um, I just want to thank my my supporters, and of course, Christine and Cindy at UC Davis, and many of the people who helped me sample or helped me collect across across the years, whether it be in Kwajalein Atoll or, or across different systems in the Pacific. And thank you for your time. Great, thank you so much, Adam. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or uh, two quick questions. If you wanna go ahead and um, in the reactions, raise your hand if you have a question. Well, um, I, had, I had a question. So you showed um, within the, oh, I'm sorry, there's a question from Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Well, I was just curious um, if you've tried any dissections to um, remove the abdomens and rule out male sperm to see if you could find support for satirization potentially, or I know some of the Pacific Islands don't have a gyp dye, so I wondered if you have islands where there's only albopictus of those two and you could compare the sequencing results. Yeah, no, we have not tried either of those. I mean, right now, yes, that we, we have not been able to find Egypti within Kwajalein Atoll, um, but it was documented there quite extensively in the 70s. That was the last time uh, an extensive assessment of the, the vectors within the Kwajalein Atoll had ever been there. So we definitely see potential satirization in the wild. Um, but yeah, I have not done any kind of uh, satirization assessment within Kwajalein Atoll. But previous analyses, did do exactly that. For instance, one, one of the um, main papers that, that looked at satirization was done in Hawaii uh, between Egypti and, and Albopictus. And so it, it's kind of interesting to kind of look on that, at that, that old, I believe it was uh, 45, 50, 1945 or 1950 paper. And, and kind of uh, once I saw that, I was like, wow, okay, so we could actually do this on the Big Island and assess uh, efficacy of satirization or at least potential for satirization. But it is there. Um, and I think a, a broader, there was a more recent, like seven, 1970s paper on satirization showing that those crosses do create hybrids. And those hybrids initially that the, look like Egypti, they look like the maternal cross, but then over generations, they look like over the next generation, they look like Albopictus. But yeah, I have not done any um, dissections to confirm satirization. Great. Um, well, thank you well, thank you so much, Adam. Um, I think we should move on. And if there's time at the end, we can uh, circle back for more questions as well. Okay, next we're gonna be hearing from Kyle uh, Yamugita, who is uh, a student, at, a trainee at the University of California, Davis. And he will be talking about uh, human flea-borne typhus and surveillance in California. Um, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes, 
Perfect, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. So yeah, as you were saying, um, my name is Kalyam Gita. I'm a third year uh, student in the graduate group for epidemiology. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about surveillance of human sleeve-borne typhus cases in California from 2011 to 2019. Um, so there are four projects that we are working on currently related to surveillance data used for this nine-year period. Uh, today, I will be focusing specifically on weather and land use associations to reported sleeve-borne typhus cases uh, in California. So briefly, I will discuss everything you all need to know about sleeve-borne typhus in about five minutes, then provide uh, objectives for this project, followed by our methods and results, uh, then, when it, then finish with our conclusions. I'm sorry also because my uh, video and USB ports decided to go on break early. So first, um, just a little background. The primary agent that is known for uh, typhus or flumor typhus is Rickettsia typhi, but Rickettsia felis is also a suspected agent, although the role in the transmission um, isn't entirely determined yet. Um, the vector are the cat flea and the rat fleas, and the reservoirs are urban wildlife, such as opossums in suburban environments and rats in urban environments, as well as domesticated animals, such as cats and dogs. Um, so there are two probiotic cycles that are dependent on the potential host. So the urban cycle that has been tied to rats and their fleas is what flea-borne typhus has typically been associated with. But more recently, the suburban cycle was proposed as other animals such as cats and opossums were associated with typhus cases and were found positive for rickettsia typhi. Uh, humans are incidental hosts of typhus that present with nonspecific febrile disease, including headaches, fever, and muscle aches. Um, humans become infected if exposed to flea feces from an infected flea via scratching the flea bites or transferring the bacteria to eyes, ears, or mouth. So flea-borne typhus has been resurging for several years. Uh, California averaged 24 cases annually between 2001 and 2012. However, um, from 2011 to 2019, there were approximately 98 cases per year. Uh, Los Angeles and Orange Counties account for 97% 90, uh, of all flea-borne typhus cases reported between 2011 and 2019. Um, and it's also important to note that this increase can in part be due to widening of the case definition in 2010, along with the increase in testing availability and relatively higher transmission pockets in Southern California. The standing hypothesis is that warmer seasons, especially the summer months, are associated with cases of flea-borne typhus. Uh, and this is supported considering most cases occur uh, between, between uh, June and September in California. Um, however, if we were to also take into account temperatures as they range, so as we can see on this graph, the average monthly temperature in Los Angeles from 2011 to 2019, um, we can see that the average temperatures are highest between July and September and are mostly consistent with the case trends over that same period of time. However, using months as an indicator uh, for seasonality may be ambiguous year to year, especially in the context of ongoing climate change and global warming. Between 2011 and 2019, um, some years had warmer spring months and others had warmer fall months, more resembling the temperatures of summer. Uh, as such, it is worth exploring temperatures uh, directly rather than relying on months as a proxy for seasonality. Another thing to consider is that the reference to the suburban versus urban transmission cycles may be subjective in some areas where single family homes are located near apartment buildings or businesses. Uh, land use can serve as an objective classifier of urban density and land use types within uh, and land use types such as uh, single family housing, apartment complexes, or etc. So with this, we can examine whether one type of land use is at higher risk for uh, for flea growth types than another. 
Uh, for example, we hypothesize that land use types consistent with suburban areas, uh, such as single family homes, larger parks, and more open space would be at higher risk than urban areas for flea-borne typhus. So that leads us to our objectives of this project, um, which were to assess the environmental variables associated with reported flea-borne typhus cases in California between 2011 and 2019. So some data sources and extractions that we did, um, the first was with weather data uh, collected from the Global uh, Historical Climatology Network, or GHCND. Um, and this gives us daily records of several different weather variables um, from, reported from weather stations nearby a person's household. So we assumed the household or the exposure locations were the household. And after map mapping the household addresses, we retrieved uh, daily data from local weather stations using the RNOAA package in R. So for example, say a case occurred in this neighborhood, um, the query would identify the nearest weather station with complete data on the variables of interest for each individual case or non-case, and then download it to the existing data set. And some of these variables uh, that we were looking at primarily were maximum temperature, minimum temperature, um, the temperature difference in a day, uh, the total pre precipitation, the average daily wind speed, and fog presence. Next, we looked at uh, land cover or land use. So we used the National Land Cover Database to collect all the land use data. Uh, we used four different radii for buffers to be similar to prior studies related to animal and flea testing around households of confirmed flea-borne type of cases, um, or, home, or the home ranges of certain animals. Uh, these were 25 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, and 250 meters. Uh, these buffers were used to extract the corresponding areas and land use by type. So for example, we can say a case occurred in this hypothetical neighborhood here. Um, we would then overlay the land cover data, then place our buffers which would extract the land use area uh, by type inside the buffer region. So for our approach, we used multivariable logistic regression to assess weather and land use associations to reported flea-borne typhus cases. Uh, because the incubation period is seven to 14 days uh, for typhus, we are interested in the weather patterns in that time range specifically as it would be more specific to exposure risk factors. Uh, models were determined with stepwise selection using a significance level of alpha equals 0 0.05 and minimizing the Akaike information criterion. Uh, this was repeated for each buffer range used to extract the land use data. data. So essentially there will be four different logistic regression models um, based on the areas that were extracted for each buffer. And then all mapping was completed in ArcGIS Pro and analyses were done in R and the packages that we used are also listed there. So first, uh, some descriptive statistics specifically for weather variables. Um, so to note upfront, the, for each chart, the exposure window is framed as seven to 14 days, as we said, um, and this is prior to the episode date. Um, episode date is either the earliest date between onset or when the case was reported, um, regardless if it was a case or not a case. Um, and this is based on the incubation period for flea-borne typhus in humans. So you can see here that when looking at the daily minimum temperature or the average daily minimum temperature, um, it was barely higher among cases compared to controls and really at most uh, approximately 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit during the exposure window. Uh, similar to the average minimum temperature, the average maximum daily temperature was slightly higher by about one degree Fahrenheit during the exposure, exposure window. So we also wanted to look at the range of temperature daily, which was the maximum minus the minimum. And the range of the temperature was generally lower among cases compared to non-cases, 
Uh, this may suggest that warmer temperatures with narrow, narrower ranges are associated with typhus cases. And this would be in line with the hypothesis that warmer months are associated with more cases. Uh, precipitation may be generally lower among cases, as we can see here, um, where the cases are the maroon purplish line. Um, but this is based on a very few number of records. Um, less than 100 records, both cases or non-cases, had reported precipitation in the 30 days prior to episode date. And this isn't entirely surprising, given that there was a statewide drought for several years during this time period, and it is even more relatively drier in Southern California, which, which is where most of our data comes from. Um, we also assessed fog presence as it can provide some insight into extreme humidity. So for example, 90% or more humidity or where air temperatures and dew point difference is less than 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, in the context of the GHCND, um, the, in the context of the GHCND database, the fog was assessed over drizzle because drizzle uh, weather types are commonly occurs when fog is present. So if I could do an analogy, uh, drizzle is the rectangle and fog is the square. Um, fog presence tended to be more reported or be reported more frequently among cases. However, approximately 75% of the records did not have fog presence noted at all. Um, so it may be difficult to generalize uh, interpretations on fog presence considering the high proportion of uh, unknowns in the data and the narrow difference between cases and non-cases. So next I wanna go over our four logistic regression models created for each buffer size. So each column here in this table represents uh, the model for each buffer size. So you can see 25 meters, 50 meters, 100 and 250 meters. Um, variables that were selected for the final model were based on AIC scores are represented by their odds ratios and 95% confidence intervals. Uh, cells with a cross indicate variables that were excluded uh, from selection due to missingness from the buffer region. In other words, uh, those buffers contained, um, no buffers for that range contained that type of land use. Um, and then dashes indicate variables that were dropped due to model fit. So at every buffer range, there was no statistically significant relationship between land use types and the reported sleepborne type of cases. In fact, all land use variables were equal to the null in their odds ratios and confidence intervals. So you can see the 1.0 odds ratio with a lot of 1.0 confidence intervals. With uh, weather variables, the lower average temperature range and a higher average temperature overall were barely statistically significant with a really small effect size. Um, something I also want to note is that you might be wondering why all the effect sizes for the weather variables are nearly equal for, regardless of the buffer size or the model use. Um, since land use associations were basically null um, regardless of the buffer size, and whether variables were used across each buffer, so they carried over. Uh, we were essentially left with four models that were nearly identical. Uh, we did an ad hoc analysis of only weather variables in a logistic regression model, and it yielded approximately the same as exact uh, effect sizes, with maybe just a slight difference in the confidence intervals. Um, so land use in this study doesn't appear to have any association with sleepborne type of cases compared to non-cases. So in conclusion, um, the buffer ranges may not play a role in the relationships between land use and type of cases because we are extracting proportional land use types in each buffer. So in other words, the land use areas being collected are homogenous for cases and non-cases, regardless of the range or the size of the buffer. So even with a larger buffer, the land use types in the area are approximately equal. Um, and that's not necessarily surprising given the urban sprawl of Southern California, where most of the land use types would be classified as medium or high intensity development. Um, using 
the classifications of land use allowed us to objectively categorize areas uh, rather than kind of saying this is more of a suburb or this is a, a urban area. Um, however, it doesn't necessarily take into a condition um, those other areas or the condition of those areas into consideration. Um, for example, the age of the structure or household or environmental pollution or other indicators in, of environmental quality within urban or suburban environments are not really measured here. Uh, however, in the context of human surveillance data, uh, we found that there is no associ association between land use and reported flea-borne typhus cases. So really at the end of the day, what can we take away from this, right? Um, a couple of key points are to focus control measures on areas and communities with persistent flea-borne typhus transmission, obviously including clusters and outbreaks. Uh, second, we can say that cases appear to be just as likely to be reported from suburban environments as they are urban environments. While the weather data did not highlight stark associations with flea-borne typhus, we can use the measurements as thresholds to begin um, awareness campaigns on importance of flea exposure prevention. Uh, for example, we can begin a public awareness initiative when the minimum temperature averages 60 degrees Fahrenheit and the maximum temperature averages 78 degrees Fahrenheit for two weeks. Um, lastly, routine surveillance of animals and fleas would greatly improve the prevention efforts. Uh, with this in mind, the approach presented today would be well suited for animal surveillance. So that way we can actually assess species specific, species -specific associations to environments while also uh, accounting for whether or not those species or fleas are testing positive or negative for Rickettsia typhi or even Rickettsia felis. So like any other project, um, this is not without some limitations. Um, the major one being that we are using human surveillance data and that really limits the inferences that can be made from these analyses. So that's because surveillance data relies on healthcare providers to test for typhus. And then healthcare access may also serve as a compounding variable in surveillance here. Uh, the use of household as a primary exposure, co uh, exposure location may also not apply to all cases. Um, that's because exposures can occur elsewhere, maybe at a park or somewhere someone went for a hike um, or even in a different area completely. Uh, the environmental relationships presented here may also be different in the context of animal or vector data. And that's because uh, that kind of touches on the exposure assessment where if the animals or the fleas are not actually located where the household is, then we might be testing something separately from where those positive animals or vectors might be. Um, and then lastly, uh, persons experiencing homelessness were not included. Uh, in this analysis, that's because we couldn't geocode them to an address specifically, but we really should highlight them and prioritize them for control and intervention, especially because they represent a higher risk population for typhus. So with that, um, I'd like to thank PACVEC for funding the study, as well as our other typhus related projects, um, and Vicky and Charthy from the CDPH Vector Borne Disease Branch, um, my PI, Beatrice Martinez Lopez, and also my classmates in the GGE for uh, your input and feedback on this project. Um, I'd also like to thank Van and Arminez with Los Angeles County Public Health for provi providing the non case data, which re really made this analysis possible. Um, so, with that, yeah. Great, thanks so much, Kyle. That was great. Um, we have some time for questions. You can go ahead and um, just speak or raise your hand using the reaction button as well. Um, so I, I had a question, Kyle. Um, so there was, you know, the, the, the lack of sort of land use um, sort of correlation kind of makes sense in sort of a highly kind of urbanized environment. Um, do you think that um, it would be interesting to sort of in include human um, behavior or other sort of uh, social factors as well in your analysis to see if there might be um, other 
kind of um, behaviors or, or factors that could influence um, transmission? Yeah, it, I think it would be hard to necessarily get directly to behaviors, but something we're planning to do is also assess socioeconomic variables um, at the census tract level to try and maybe assess whether also getting at the confounding variable for healthcare access, but maybe also um, different things like environmental pollution and things like that. Um, behavior itself might be a little bit difficult because it can be subjective in how we categorize, but it would be very valuable because then we can kind of assess whether this is driven by human behavior or crossing over exposures to animals or vice versa or uh, a mixture of the both. Great. Um, so we have a question from Chris in the chat. I'm just going to read it off here. Um, many other factors that affect transmission, for example, vertebrate or vector activity or movement vary seasonally, which can create an apparent association with seasonal temperatures that may not be causal. Did you consider potential confounders of the climate? Um, I'm not sure what FBT relationship means, but um, yeah, did you consider confounders with climate? Yeah, so we were trying to, I, the thought was that um, temperature would serve as a control in a sense for that kind of uh, difference because also um, the incubation period for rickettsia typhi can vary based on the temperature, at least in uh, fleas. Um, so we thought that we could try and control that here. Um, I'm kind of at a loss right now to how else to approach it, um, at least without also including animal or vector data, because as long as we're using uh, human surveillance data, it really limits the utility of that kind of control um, because we're then using humans as a proxy for exposure. So I think first and foremost, it would be really beneficial to have some kind of standardized surveillance system for animal hosts and, uh, and or fleas. Um, and then we approach the, that uh, data with these kinds of analyses. Right, it really does seem like some kind of um, more uh, ecological studies uh, of the vector and the potential reservoirs would be really important. Um, let's see, we have another question from Laura Kruger. Um, who asks, considering many of the host animals for fleas are companion animals who spend most of their life indoors, how much do you think climate impacts disease transmission? Yeah, that's a, definitely a good point. I think that in that scenario with household pets, it probably wouldn't affect it very much. And I think also in the overall scheme of things, the climate in Southern California is very steady, even when you go into fall and winter there isn't as stark of a change um, in temperatures there or weather. Um, but as far as considering like household pets, it probably wouldn't affect them as much as it would the uh, possums and feral or community cats. Um, I think that what we're more so seeing when we look at the weather and uh, the weather variables here is that it's more specific to this region um, just in general because the weather pattern stays so, um, stays so uh, specific in that range um, compared to other parts of the state. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily expect the weather patterns to change the ecology here very much. But again, I would be hesitant to make that conclusion without also looking at animal and vector data, um, also reassessing it with this analysis too. Great, thank you. Um, are there any other questions um, for either speaker, um, for Adam or Kyle? We can open it up for just a general discussion now since we have a few minutes. Hi, my name is Robert Cummings. Can anybody hear me? Yes, go ahead, Robert. Yes, uh, health departments, uh, this is a question about what type of uh, data you have. Uh, health departments often record, at least our experience here in Orange County, uh, what sort of host, what sort of animals have, the, does, is the person associated with? For example, if they've seen possums on the property, if they had uh, uh, their pet animal, companion animals, something like that. Have you, 
access that or is that in your database in any again it might be loose because it's a based on personal interviews with the people and so on like that but it also is somewhat uh, helpful guidance anyhow to see if they have this companion animals association or if they've seen a lot of feral cats around their property things like that is that available to you or have you asked for it yeah um actually a different project we're working on just like a summary of all the last nine years worth of data um, I was looking at that and I looked at a lot of your guys' notes in Orange County as well. So I not only looked at if you guys check the box whether cats or not are uh, present, but then went through all the case records to look for specific reference to feral or community cats. Um, and we did total that and we're working on writing that paper out right now. Um, one thing I will say is like the difficult thing with the self-reported animal exposures is that they don't really serve as a good proxy for whether that expo what that exposure is because in a sense a lot of the time um, even when I was with Long Beach it was kind of like a have you seen cats around the home or in the neighborhood or um, inside your home or things like that and because we don't have that kind of scale of adjacency to the person um, the risk isn't necessarily going to be the same for a cat you saw on the block versus a cat that is actively living in your backyard or possums or rats or things like that. So it kind of limits our interpretability of that data. Um, something I would say is going back to the um, animal data, if we do work on something like that in the future, is that it can't really be conditional on if a case occurs or not just because that would kind of become redundant for a lot of the work that you and Dr. or and Laura Kruger have done in Orange County where you have sampled animal data or animals or trapped fleas and uh, opossums in response to an outbreak or a series of cases. Um, I'm more so thinking in the context of prevention, um, we could have some kind of surveillance for animal exposures, um, even if it's passive, because then that gives you guys, the vector control agencies, a lot more uh, information before a case even occurs. Um, and then we can an analyze that information to uh, really es establish the risk for different types of animal species, as opposed to it being conditional on someone being reported as a case and then saying if they saw in a cat or a possum or a rat or whatever else um, around their household. Yes, thanks for at least uh, acknowledging that. We know it's loose data that we, we've seen that. That's the sort of associations we, we've noticed. It just, I wasn't clear whether or not you had that uh, part of your analysis and so on. So, yeah. you know, and we've done some uh, uh, animal collections around host cases, um, and including uh, picking fleas off their uh, companion animals too, you know, in some of our work. So, yeah, I've read a lot of your work and uh, Laura Kruger's work too, I've pretty much read as much as I can find on it. So it's been really in helpful information as far as, you know, establishing what we know about ecology and epidemiology of type, type is as of now. Um, I think we can also expand what you have done into something more systematic to make a really like a full encompassing um, prevention strategy for typhus, especially with the rising cases. Yes, well, we've always been, <laughs> we've always tried to reach out to other groups to see uh, what else can be added on because we can only do so much at our level and our level of expertise, but we've developed in-house testing now uh, for both um, potential agents with Typhi and Felis and even subparts of that. So we have a fair amount of data on some of that stuff. And we've even worked with CDC on this too. You saw one of the papers, so. Anyhow, thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, we are at the one o'clock hour now, exactly. Oh, but now it's 101. Um, so we'll call this to a close. But thank you um, so much to our two speakers, Adam Barcino and Kyle Yomogida. Um, please join me in thanking them for um, their presentations today. And thanks. Uh, we'll see you guys next time.